The history of child welfare in America is a story about the worthy and unworthy poor, social responsibility, and the debate between preserving the family unit or removing the child in hopes of a successful socialization. When the colonists came to America, they brought the poor laws with them. The United States was based on traditions and values that linked poverty with personal inadequacy and linked financial dependence with moral failings. In colonial times, the small population allowed a voluntary response system of support, where community overseers identified the needs of the impoverished family and whether or not the specific family was worthy of the community's help. Social welfare measures such as farming out, indenture, and apprenticeship fulfilled the needs of the community while isolating the undesirable elements of society. As the population grew, outdoor support could not be given to everyone. Almshouses were built to house the worthy poor, the very old, disabled, or seriously ill. While informal safety nets existed for most of the white population, Native Americans, slaves, and indentured servants had to develop their own self-help mechanisms. As the cities and factories grew, kinship ties were frequently broken because of wage work away from home. More and more families had to rely on outside support to keep their families afloat. In the pre-Civil War period, reformers turned to formal institutions as a means to address a variety of social problems. Institutions for the insane, for children, for the disabled, were built with a sense of hope and idealism. There was a new awareness of children as children, young people who will grow into adults and who have to somehow become a productive member of society. America needed an institution that would cut off the threat of inherited pauperism. Although a lot of hope was placed in the orphanages, there were too few of them to deal with the growing number of dependent, homeless, orphaned, and delinquent children. The available orphanages had horrible living conditions, and like the almshouses, most excluded minority children from their care. Reformers did not care for the Native American culture, and they sought to assimilate Indian children into mainstream society by forcing kids into military-style boarding homes. When children came out of the schools, they could not fit in anywhere. In 1853, the Children's Aid Society introduced a new approach to child care, the foster home. The dependent white child was expected to work for their foster family until adulthood. Often children were taken out of their city environments and moved to farms thousands of miles away. In 1909, the first White House Conference on Children raised concerns about the practice of breaking up families, with 170,000 children in out-of-home care due to poverty alone. In response to this high number, the first state's mother's pension law was enacted in Illinois in 1911, and by 1920, 40 states had passed similar legislation and greatly expanded the role of public welfare. Under the new laws, field investigators had the power to judge which mothers were immoral and which were truly deserving of aid. In the first half of the 20th century, paid foster care was introduced. This shift from institutional care in almshouses to personal homes gradually gave minority children the option of being placed in foster homes. By the 1920s, America was the richest country on earth, but many low-income workers could not make enough money to support their families. Because of the differences between earned wages and living wages, children had to go to work to help support their families. A 1910 census reported that 1,750,000 children between the ages of 10 and 15 were gainfully employed. Legislation gradually curbed child labor, but the need for wages continued to show that the economy was working for the wealthy while the poor struggled to meet their families' needs. In the first half of the 20th century, changes in public welfare administration resulted in a shift of responsibility from individual overseers of the poor to local county or state departments. Increasingly, progressives came to see that poverty was primarily an economic, not a moral condition. Even before the Great Depression, the public sector established itself as an innovator in addressing poverty and need. At the 1930 White House Conference on Children, the Urban League called attention to the discrimination that existed against black parents in income maintenance programs, medical care, and services to unwed mothers. Institutional discrimination was creating poverty in the black community and was taking black children away from their homes. 
In 1935, the Aid to Dependent Children program was established as a Title IV-A Act to the Social Security Act. The Act authorized the first federal grants for child welfare services. States could determine who was eligible to receive the new benefits. Some states adopted home suitability clauses, which tried to weed out immoral homes from being eligible for benefits. These clauses ruled out the majority of African American families living in the South from receiving public welfare assistance. Mississippi, Florida, and Louisiana actually removed thousands of black children from their welfare roles. These children were then labeled as neglected since their parents could not financially support them. Attacks on public aid programs highlighted society's changing perception of the welfare recipient. Taxpayers in the 1950s did not want their money going to divorced and single mothers and jobless men, the so-called unworthy poor. In 1961, the Fleming Rule tried to fix the biased policies that determined eligibility for benefits by deciding that social services as well as cash payments should be provided to parents or other relatives caring for children. Although the Fleming Rule was designed to protect the rights of children, the mandated services often led to the greater weakening of family systems. Often culturally insensitive service providers remove children from what they judge to be undesirable family situations and place them in foster care. In 1963, 81% of children in foster care were there because their parents were unmarried or because they came from broken homes. The practice of removing Native American children and putting them in boarding schools was stopped in 1978 with the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act. This legislation gave priority for placing Indian children in extended families or with Indian foster or adoptive family and gave extra financial support to try to actually maintain the Native American family unit. In 1974, Due to growing media attention on the problem, the Child Abuse and Prevention Act, CAPTA, was passed, which gave funds to states for the prevention and treatment of child abuse and neglect, and required states to report cases of abuse. This mandatory reporting led to more investigations and removals of children in care, and by 1977, more than 502,000 children were in the out-of-home care system. A majority of them were from single-parent homes. Neglect is often the product of poverty, and as populations of color are disproportionately poor, children of color are disproportionately placed in out-of-home care due to a lack of economic opportunities. Kids in the welfare system are innocent victims of America's unequal access to resources and support. Congress passed the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act of 1980, which required that a written case plan be developed for each child in the welfare system and prioritize child welfare outcomes. One, family preservation. Two, family reunification. Three, adoption. And four, foster care. This act was initially effective in lowering the number of children in institutions, but it never received full funding. Soon, the number of kids in care rose again, and many continued to cycle through the system. The Family Preservation and Support Services Program of 1993, later known as Promoting Safe and Stable Families, gave greater federal funding for services to support, prevent, and remedy difficulties of families of children and eligible Indian tribes who are in crisis. It also created a new state grant program to provide educational and training vouchers for youth who age out of the foster care system. Today, family and child welfare programs continue to distinguish between worthy and unworthy poor, focus on individuals instead of family units, and separate families without offering solutions to problems of socioeconomic inequality. Every year, there are over 500,000 children in the foster care system. States now get greater funding for foster care, but not for prevention services to keep kids out of the system.